Hey, welcome to our Change How You Think video. And uh, we have a special episode for you today. And this is a special extended edition because as you know, that in the last two weeks, the world's attention has actually been diverted from the pandemic. And we're now focusing on the pandemic of racism that's been going on for centuries. And it's fascinating to me how the, it, that anything could shift the world's attention off of the pandemic, that this, the event that happened in America with the police, the police action has so shifted our attention and exposed such a massive injustice that now our focus has moved from the virus to a social problem that has been concealed for so long. And so uh, this week, we really want to focus on that issue. We spent weeks talking about the pandemic, but now we need to talk about this issue of racial discrimination, racial inequality that is happening inside and outside the church. And so we have a special guest because I want to hear the voices of the black voices because as a white person, I can't address this issue in the podcast. I need someone to tell me their experience. So I'm in listening and learning mode now. And so to do that, I've invited a really good friend of mine, Craig Forbes, and he is one of the leaders at my home church. And Craig uh, sits on the board of directors of our church. He's also involved in so many ministries. I don't have enough fingers to count them. Uh, he's involved in lots of ministries at our church and international ministries. He's involved in missions. And uh, he is just um, a pillar in our church. He's a very godly man. He just exudes the love and the grace of Jesus. And so I invited him to come on uh, with me today to tell me some of his experiences uh, with racism and racial discrimination that he's experienced here in Canada. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then I want him to share with all of us some of the solutions that God has shown him. So Craig, we just want to welcome you to the podcast. There's people uh, watching from all over the world. And uh, we're just uh, so happy to have you. And we just really want to hear some of your experiences and then what God's placed on your heart. <clears throat> Amen. So, uh, you've told me some of these uh, really outrageous uh, things that have happened to you, but why don't you start by telling us what happened when you were driving, uh, just you were driving through Orangeville, Ontario. Oh, okay. Well, my wife and I, we moved up to Orangeville, which is um, not too many people of color up in that town, but it's a beautiful town. And I was just driving on the main street one day, police car pulled up beside me, the officer looked over, and next thing you know, he dropped back. And lights went on and he pulled me over. And I said, officer, how you doing? He goes, just want to make sure you're wearing your seatbelt. And I was a little bit stunned because being beside me, it was obvious that my seatbelt was across my chest. But while he had me stopped, he proceeded to go ahead and get other information on me. And I mean, it, he left without incident, without any charges or anything, but it was just very frustrating and humiliating because I knew I did nothing wrong. And I actually overcompensate when I see a police around, just not to draw attention to myself. Well, because that, I'm sure you felt like you were being harassed. Yes, absolutely. And then you were telling me that uh, uh, one time, uh, and so you and I both uh, were up in Toronto, you were walking on the street with an uncle, so he was obviously a lot older than you. And then and what happened there? So um, we were getting ready to move, and so we needed boxes. So there was a grocery store at Bathurst in um, St. Clair area. So we went by there to get some boxes. We were walking on the sidewalk, my uncle and myself, and um, next thing you know, a police car raced up and blocked us on the sidewalk, and two officers jumped out and demanded to see ID. I said, what's, what is the problem? What's going on? We have reports of two black guys on the subway causing problems. And myself, I said, well, why don't you go on the subway and find those two black guys? <laughs> well, they didn't find it that funny, but nothing came out of it. But we did have to produce ID before they allowed us to continue on our way. And, and how did that make you feel? It, it's humiliating and it's frustrating because not only are you standing there in that situation with two officers, you're at their mercy, but people are driving by and people are walking by. And in their mind, they're thinking, these guys must have done something wrong. So that was actually shaming. Yes, it was. 
Um, you told me that um, you actually love skiing. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm sure there's not a lot of black people on ski resorts because I've spent a lot of time skiing and I haven't seen too many. But you told me that, that you were actually on a, um, you had a car full and you were going on a ski trip some time ago. This is probably when you were single. Yes, I was, I was single. <laughs> I, was with, I was with myself and three other guys and um, we were heading up to um, Collinwood to go skiing. That's something I love to do. I know it's not the norm, but I love doing weird things. But anyways, we were passing through um, Shelburne, Ontario, and we decided that, you know, we should grab some snacks while we're here. So I believe there was a Becker's at the time, and we went inside, and as we were walking into the store, a police officer was walking out, and he said, where are you guys going? So we said, we're going skiing. And he kind of looked puzzled and then made the comment, like, black guys don't ski. And so <laughs> we kind of just shook it off. We went to the store, got the things that we wanted. We came out of the store, and there was a police car parked across the street. We got into the car, and we started to drive, and he followed us all the way to the city limits before he turned around and went back to where he came from. And how did that make you feel? Well, at that time, we were young, and we were annoyed by it, but we, we just kind of laughed it off. Like, you know, like we just thought it was funny. But when you look back at it now, it was a blatant mistrust and, you know, stereotyping and, you know, classifying people based on your racial biases. And you say you have an expression, DYB, what does that mean? Oh, drive on while black. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we joke about that all the time. Even the other day, my friend, my next door neighbor tinted my windows on my van and he wanted to tint the front ones. I said, no, you can't do that. I said, why? He said, why? He's Polish, by the way. And I said, well, if a police officer pulls up beside me, I want him to be able to see me. And he goes, I don't get it. My windows are tinted. I said, you've never, you've never heard of DWB? And he goes, no, I said, drive them while black. I said, I don't want to give any reason or any excuses to be pulled over, especially because I spend many times in the United States. So he was puzzled, but I understand what I, what I was talking about. Oh, my. Um, you told me that, uh, that you went into, your, your wife works for a, 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 one of the big five banks here in Canada. And you went yes. into a bank, a branch that uh, in, the, in the, the organization she works for, you went into a branch to cash a check. And yes, that's this correct. This wouldn't be all that long ago. And, no. uh, and so what was your experience? You just, it was a very, very simple transaction. What happened there when you went into the bank? So I went into the bank. There was quite a lineup and the cashier were, they were busy serving other customers. And I slowly, when I walked in, I saw the manager of customer service sitting at her desk and she looked up at me and you know, you could tell by the look that you got some special attention. So as I got to the front of the line, she jumped up out of her desk and rushed to the front to, to serve me personally, even though the other cashiers were available. And this is something that I do on a regular basis, cash checks at the bank. And she refused to cash the check and said it was policy. And I said, what do you mean you're talking about policy? This is something I do on a regular basis. And she says, sir, I'm sorry, I can't do this for you. This is policy. And it, it, it was very frustrating because there were people in line behind me and I'm sure they were looking like I was a troublemaker or I was causing problems. And the cash, other cashiers are probably thinking she probably jumped up to serve this guy because she has history with him, but it was my first time in that branch. And so my wife is a branch relations manager. So it means every branch manager in the region would know her by name. And so I went home and I was very angry. I was very frustrated. And I told my wife what happened and she was livid. She called the branch manager and shared my experience. And short time later, the branch manager called me with an apology and said that the cashier, the, the, manage, Brent, the customer service manager will, will be spoken to. Well, you've already said how that made you feel. Um, yeah. And uh, you told me that you were, you, came, you were on a missions trip in Guatemala. And that yes. you were preaching and leading people to Jesus and seeing miracles. And what happened on your flight back, uh, on your flight home? Okay, so... <laughs> I don't want to drag it out too long, but I saw the power of God move in that country. For over 10 days, I preached in eight cities, morning, noon, and night. We started a church while I was there. 
saw the spirit of suicide broken over a region. We saw people being healed. We saw people being delivered and set free and most important salvation. So coming back from a trip like that, I was on such a high. It was, it was incredible. And, you know, being on the airplane, I, I noticed that I was the only black person on the plane. That didn't bother me, but I, I noticed that. And coming off the plane, you know, going through customs, custom this, officer was says. This, was this customs in Toronto? No, it was actually customs in Montreal because okay. I had a transfer and flight from Montreal to, to Toronto. But um, I landed and the custom officer asked me where I was, what I was doing. And I told him and I'm thinking he would be saying, wow, that's great. Humanitarian trip, right? Because some of the other people on the plane, you could clearly see that they were hippies and they go down there just to do whatever they do. And so I saw him write something down and I figured, okay, great. I have time for my connecting flight. When I got to the next officer, I was... Um, ordered for a search and it was quite an extensive search everything was out of my suitcase they checked all the liners for drugs and it's almost like he was determined to find something and even saying i have a flight a connecting flight that i'm going to miss it was basically that's your problem and so sure enough when everything was said and done um you know i was frustrated but you're at their mercy and you can't show that frustration um, sure enough, I missed my connecting flight, um, which was with Air Canada. And I know their policy is to put you on the next, the next available flight if it's something that's not your own. Well, I went to their customer representative and they basically said, well, we can't do anything for you. Obviously, you must have done something wrong. And that was frustrating to no end. And so I couldn't get a representative to, to, to support me. So out of just desperation, I went over to um, an East Indian descent person at WestJet and they had me on the next available flight. But it was just that feeling of like being viewed as a criminal and not respected and not even being listened to. That, that frustration was just boiling up inside me and everything that God did on that trip, it just brought everything crashing down. And I, I can't even put into words how I felt at that time, coming back to my home to my country. So you were racially profiled? Yes, absolutely. Oh, Craig, you have a lot of stories. Um, you, you and I both grew up in Toronto, and there's a, a, a spot in Toronto that anyone from Toronto would know. It's, yes. it's where all the mansions are located in North York. And, uh, so it's, and driving through there is like driving through Beverly Hills. And I remember growing up, my parents would drive me through there just as a tourist, we would just drive really slow and just gawk at the mansions and all the famous right. people who live there. And I remember <clears throat> I've driven there with my wife and it's, it's to, to me, it's a tourist event to drive down that street and, and right here we are in the middle of Toronto, all these enormous mansions of movie stars and things. And so I've done it many times, driving slow and just, you know, staring. And uh, so what happened when you drove down there? Uh, well, just, just like yourself, um, I love looking at mansions and big homes and I love the landscape and everything else. And my friend and I, who's also of color, were driving through and we were actually pulled over and asked, what are you doing around here? What business do you have in this area? <laughs> and how'd that make you feel? It, 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 it's frustrating and you, you answer to the best of your ability without showing any aggression or frustration because you don't want it to escalate to the next level. But yeah, you, you feel, you leave feeling like second class. Like we pay taxes, we have the sticker on the car like everybody else. We have a right to be on any road in this province or even in this country. But feeling like, what are you doing in this area? What's your business here? That, that, it's just, it's, I, I can't even describe how that makes you feel but it, it's not it's not a good feeling yeah and, and especially it's a road that i've driven on as a tourist many times and of course they don't stop me no so yeah you were you were profiled that you also mentioned one time you, you you were just driving into a gas station just to get gas and what happened there Oh, yeah, my, it was at nighttime. It was at Bayview and uh, Bayview and Shepherd, and there's a gas station in on the Toronto, corner. For those of you who don't. Yes, know. yeah, and so I mean, we laugh about it, but it's not that funny, really. So we um, pulled into the gas station, and the gas station attendant, it was a self service, saw us outside, turned off the lights, locked the doors, and hid behind a counter, and we could not, for the life of us, understand or 
believe what, what just happened, but it did happen, you know. And how did that make you feel? It, it, it was frustrating. It was kind of comical to be like, you know, it was, it was comical because we were laughing at this person's reaction, but it, it, it was frustrating that they would actually even view us as that because I have never have any, had any criminal tendencies. I don't know anybody that's ever been in trouble with the police. We're all hardworking, you know, professionals and to be seen automatically as a criminal, you know, it just, it, 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 it frustrates you. Yeah, well, it's actually, it's actually very painful. Now, you married a white woman. Yes, I and, did. Uh, who we love, and she is just the, the most wonderful, godly woman, and uh, you picked well. Actually, you and I both married up. Yes, we did. <laughs> and, and so, um, but tell me, you told me two events, um, that the fact that you were walking with your wife, uh, one was in Florida, and so what happened? Well, the one in Florida, we weren't walking, we were driving on the Florida Turnpike, and it was kind of an isolated area, not too many vehicles on the street, and um, she had her feet up on the dash. She's a beautiful woman. If you saw her, you'd be like, wow. But So a van pulled up beside us, and the gentleman looked over, and he saw her, and then he saw me, and the next thing you know, it was a fight for our lives. He tried to run us off the road. He was going in front of us, slamming on his brakes. We would slow down, he would slow down. We would change lanes, he would change lanes. And it, was, it went on for quite some time. We didn't even have a cell phone to call the police. And at some point, he took something out of his vehicle and threw it at our van, leaving a big dent in the side. And there was no reason for him to behave like that other than the fact that he hated seeing us together as a mixed biracial couple. Craig, you, and I'm sure you have many more. Yes. Yeah. And like to me, because I deal with emotional health, this is just layer upon layer upon layer of shame, injustice, hurt, humiliation, stereotyping, um, none of which you deserved. Like you didn't earn any of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, just as a white person, I haven't experienced those things. And it's, it's just, it's really illuminating to hear that that's going on in, in my city. Like this is, I mean, we're not, you're not talking about another country. You're talking about the city I grew up in, areas that I frequent. This is local. Mm -hmm. Now, you also have some, you also have an amazing story of what happened to you in grade seven in Toronto. This really touched my heart. What happened? So um, I just want to, you know, validate. I came from Jamaica at the, at, at the age of nine, and I was kept back a year because from Jamaica, they figured that your level of education wouldn't be the same, but actually it was higher. And so going through school from, they put me in grade three all the way through, it was just a walk in the park. In grade seven, I had a teacher named Mr. McDonald, and I wrote an English test. And on this test, I got perfect. And going around giving people back their tests, he stopped at my desk, tore up the, tape, the paper in front of me and said, you must have cheated. So um, there was a guy in our class and it was the least, last person you would expect to jump up and say something, but his name was Greg Goldenough. And he jumped up and he says, you cannot treat people like that, you know? and. He really let the teacher have it. And because of his jumping up and speaking up, I was allowed to rewrite that test. And rewriting the test, I, I scored a perfect score again. How did that event make you feel? One, that having your test ripped up. And then how did it make you feel when this other student was brave enough to talk back to a teacher in grade seven? Um, at that age, being treated like that, it was, um, it was scary. It, it, you know, it was scary because I know in myself that there was no cheating involved. And I didn't even see racial profiling because I wasn't living a life where I was aware of those things. You know, like there was things that would happen, but it was just accepted as the norm. But looking back at that now, you see clearly what that was. But it, it, it was very good that this guy, Greg Oldenoff, jumped up and spoke up because it, it made me, it, it, it just, it was 
nice to have somebody stand up for you when you're not able to stand up for yourself. And his actions is forever in my heart. I saw him a few years ago at a reunion and I thanked him so much. He didn't even remember, but that small act that he doesn't even remember spoke volumes to me. So because you, you were at that very vulnerable age, you were being shamed and humiliated and identified. Yes. And then this fella, actually your own age, actually stepped in and intervened. Yes. So, so Craig, you know, this is, I'm sure most of the viewers watching, I just have no idea what you have to, what people of color have to put up with on an ongoing basis that you, you've tried to just laugh off, well, you know, that's life, but we don't have to put up with that. So what are some of the suggestions you have for the people who are viewing? How can we actually make a difference now other than just saying, oh, that's too bad? Right. So um, I, I, when I was speaking to you the other day, I just basically summed it up to one thing. See something, say something. You know, sometimes you might be in the grocery store and you see the way that the cashier interacts with everyone in front of you. And if you see them at, interacting differently with a person of color or somebody who's different and you see that they're treating that person differently, see something, say something. Get to that cashier and just say, the way that you treat that person is not right. Like, don't just brush it off like it's nothing. But like I said, see something, say something. And another thing I would like to say is, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't overcompensate. Don't go out of your way and over and above what, how you would normally behave to make a person of color feel comfortable. Just treat them like every other person that you would treat. And, you know, my grandfather, he's passed now, but he said, treat everyone until they give you reason not to respect them. Treat everyone with respect. And I live by that rule. And I think that that would probably be one of the best solutions. Don't see people as black, as white, as Indian, as Chinese. Just see people as people and treat them with the dignity and the respect that they deserve. And, and you, is there anything in the Bible, any scripture verses that stand out to you that uh, would, could help us in this situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in Matthew 10, um, 32 and 33, Jesus was speaking and he says, Whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father in heaven. But who denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And, you know, many times we, we look at denying like Peter. When Peter says, I don't know the man. And Peter denied Christ three times before the crow, the, the cock crowed. And, you know, Jesus turned around and looked at him. Denying is not always necessarily saying, I don't know the person or I didn't see anything. Sometimes denying is just not saying anything at all. So like if a police officer says that anybody witnessed this accident and you just stand there with your arms folded and you say nothing, you basically denied that you've seen anything. And so speak up, you know, speak up and call it for what it is. You know, um, there's another verse, passage of scriptures, that's also in the Matthew, and it's also in the other Gospels. Matthew 25, 45, 42 to 45. Jesus says, for I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick, I was in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they said, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, or as a stranger, or naked, or sick in prison, and did not minister to you? And Jesus says, surely I say to you, as much as you did not do to the least of them, you did not do it to me. And we're not referring to people as the least, but we need to treat people with the dignity and the respect that they deserve. And we just need to look beyond the racial lines and divides and see, especially as believers, let's see into the heart of people and let's see. You know, like never strip people of their dignity and never allow somebody's dignity to be stripped. You see something, you say something. And I think that that's probably the best thing. And another thing is when people share their experiences with you, you know, we use this term one up. Listen, hear the heart of that person as they're speaking to you, because there's nothing more frustrating than trying to share something with somebody and they can't wait for you to finish so that you can share your story. You know, listen. and pray now what about um you know right that right now the people who are watching that all the, the demonstrations um there's a lot of sympathy for the cause 
But yeah. you pointed out there's a difference between sympathy and what, how are you explaining that to me? So when Jesus was here on this earth, the Bible says that he looked out on the multitude and they were wandering like sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion. And compassion is an action word. It's doing something about what you see. I said, sympathy is not compassion. Sympathy is basically just saying, you know what? I feel bad. I see what's happening to that person and I don't agree with it and I feel bad. Compassion is putting that, that feeling into action and doing something about it. And that's what we're called to do as believers. So that really is our take home message today. Because right now there's an overflowing of sympathy with the demonstrations yes. and this tremendous focus on racial inequality. But what you're saying is compassion is really sympathy in action. Yes. Amen. Because that's, that's really, God has given us such an eye opener in the last two weeks that uh, he really wants, especially the Christian community to lead the way. Amen. Yes. So Craig, would you be willing to pray for us? Uh, if, for me and for all the people watching so that we could that so we won't just go back to our normal lives and just say oh yeah that was you know that was unfortunate and we just go on with our normal lives could you just pray that that there is lasting change that will actually continue through the generations amen amen yes father we want to bless you and thank you god you're a god of mercy love grace and compassion and you are full of wisdom. And your word says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of you. And you will give it to us. You'll give it to us, God. And so today we ask, we ask for wisdom. Wisdom of your spirit. Spirit of the living God that lives in each and every one of us that calls ourselves believers. Father, I pray in your mighty name that you, God, by your wisdom, would open up our eyes and our hearts of understanding. Lord, your word says that it's you that works in us to do your will and good pleasure. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I thank you that right now, even as we're praying, Holy Spirit, that you're stirring up something inside of us. You're moving inside of us. You're, you're doing something inside of us that's going to make a change, an everlasting change. And just as Jesus had compassion, Father, I pray that you'd fill us with that same compassion, that we would have the boldness to speak when we need to be spoken. Father, your word said that the spirit of God hovered upon the face of the deep and God said, and, and things were created. Father, let your children be filled with your word. And as we speak, Holy Spirit will just, will just do what you purpose and plan to do. Father, help us not to, to be blind to the things around us. Help us not to, to, be, to be frustrated, but we turn everything that we see, everything that we hear into prayer. And we just trust you, God, that you would move by the power of your spirit to change situations. You can calm any storm in an instant, Lord, that you would just bring change, bring compassion, bring love to every situation. In Psalm 23, the word says that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God, as your ambassadors, as you lead us into situations, when we walk through those situations, let us leave behind us goodness and mercy. I thank you, Father, for, for what you're doing. As, as Grant said over and over, even Joseph quoted what the devil meant for harm, God turns for good. And Lord, I just pray that this discussion will just stir up hearts and it will begin, open up dialogues and we will begin to understand each other and we will look beyond racial divide and everything, God. We, we know that you created man in your image and in your likeness. It's man that is formed these divisions of races. You made one race, which is the human race. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that in heaven there's nations and tribes from every tongue, every nation. We will see it, God. And allow us to see through the spiritual eyes that you've given to us, every brother and sister, no matter how different that they are from us, that we will see them as one, as you and the Father are one. We bless you, Father, for your wisdom, and we thank you for your grace, and we pray that you just pour it out upon us, that we would just be the salt of this earth, and we will be the light of this world, Lord, and we will expose darkness, and we will bring your calm and your peace and your love and your wisdom to every situation and to every walk of life. We thank you for what you're doing, and we thank you for all that you're going to do. And we pray that through it all, God, 
you will receive the honor and the glory that's due to your name. And we thank you for this all now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Craig, we just want to thank you for, for taking the time to speak with all of us, to tell us the, the real painful, uh, just a, really a snippet of the painful events that you've had to live through. And, yes. uh, and, but your, 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 your solution is so powerful to when you see something, say something. So Craig, Amen. thanks so much for joining us. And uh, you've, really, you've really helped us understand and then know what to do. So it's been great having you, Craig. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. God bless you. And thank you for the great work that you're doing. Thanks, Craig.